September, the year of our Lord, 2023. My name is Ron Stauffer. I'll be bringing the message today. We will be continuing in our study through the epistles of John. First we did 1 John, then 2 John. Now we're in 3 John. This is 3 John, part 2. We're going to be in verses 7 through 14 today of 3 John. And also, if you want to go ahead and put your finger in the, your Bible or one of the ribbons there, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 5 very briefly, verses 17 through 22. <clears throat> now the title of our message today is Us and Them. How many of you are a product of the 1970s and listen to rock and roll music in the 70s? Does that title ring a bell with you? Sorry, I'm a child of the 70s. Pink Floyd on the album, uh, The Dark Side of the Moon, the biggest, the largest selling record album of all time in the world up until about, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, and they have a song on there, Us and Them. Paul, as you may recall, read pagan poets. And I guess so do I. <laughs> and probably so do you. And sometimes their observations are astute. Their solutions are almost always wrong, but they can correctly read problems and the status and the state of the world. And so uh, I wasn't inspired by that song, but I titled this Us and Them, and then I got about halfway into studying the series, and I went, wait a second, there's a song by that name. So I looked up the lyrics, and sure enough, there's some poignant uh, things that the poets there had to say. And I encourage you when you go home to uh, maybe to look into that. So if you, would, if you would rise with me, we're not going to get into rock and roll today, but we are going to get into the Word of God, far more profitable. We'll be in 3 John. I'm going to read uh, 3 John, the entire epistle, but remember that our focus is going to be on the verses 7 through 14 today. But, you know, it doesn't cost us anything more to do the first six verses as well because it, that's short. And then we're, I'm going to flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 22. First, Lord God, I ask you to bless my speaking today and that you would, uh, that you would be the preacher today, Lord, and not me. And that you would speak directly to our hearts, to our minds, and that you would bring clarity to everything uh, that we'd cover in your word today, in Jesus' name, amen. This is a reading from the epistle, the third epistle of John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on your journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore ought to receive such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. 
but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And now we go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 22. And you see from 1 John, I'm going to just draw the connection here. You see from 3 John, rather, that um, John calls out Diotrephes, who we think is acting as an elder or the bishop of the church there. And uh, so is John in line by doing that, calling him out by name? Well, Paul tells us and teaches us here in 1 Timothy how to handle elders, bishops, pastors, who are a detriment to the church, who are harming the church. He says in 1 Timothy 5.17, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourselves pure. Lord God, I pray that you would teach us from this, that you would give us a sober spirit about our conduct in the household of God, in the family of God, and also, Lord, that you would continue to call to accountability pastors, bishops, teachers, elders, those in leadership in the church, Lord, and that, that your name would not be be smirched by the behavior of the leaders in the churches, but that they would honor you always, Lord. Wherever you choose to use us to accomplish your will in this endeavor, Lord, God, we say that we are willing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Please have a seat. Well, harsh words from Paul to Timothy, considering that he sent Timothy out to appoint elders in every city. And, uh, and he, he draws Timothy's attention to, so that Timothy can teach it, he draws Timothy's attention to the fact that you know the old saying, good help is hard to find? Well, good elders are hard to find. I ran the numbers on that one time, and it just was boggled. You know, good pastors are hard to find. Good Bible teachers are hard to find. And there's, a, there's in several places in the New Testament, there's a list of qualifications just to even be able to walk in the door as an elder, a teacher, a pastor, a bishop. And then, on top of all that, if you meet those requirements... The scripture then says, and he must be able to teach. And that's where so many fall down. But it's also the same in reverse. There are those who are able to teach who have no business getting in the pulpit. They have no business opening the scriptures and expounding upon the scriptures to other people, though they be loquacious, though they be eloquent in speech, even if they are accurate in their exegesis, in their exposition of God's Word. It's still a package deal. God chooses not just the words, but the man and, and the woman. You're going to have a ladies' Bible study this morning. And it's important that those who lead that study be ladies of integrity and be uh, living a life which is not dishonorable to God. And, and this, is how we, this is how we choose and support the, those who teach. He said uh, in 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. He's actually talking about money there. He's saying it's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to pay your elders so that they don't starve, so that they can have a wife and children. And especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. It's a job. It's actually a job. If you've ever 
presented a message and you spent 25, 26, 30 hours, on the, it's a job. But what a privilege, what a privilege of a job it is. Can you imagine getting paid to bury yourself in God's word? Like people would support you to do that and say, like, look, we'll take care of the groceries. You bury yourself in God's word and you feed me with God's word. What an honor. What an honor that is. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the laborer, the laborer is worthy of his wages. And in your Bible, you may see that that's in red. It's actually quoting Jesus Christ. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. This is to prevent, obviously, this is to prevent power plays and gossip and those things that would tear down the ministry of teaching in the church. You realize that anybody who occupies a pulpit or occupies a, a lectern of teaching the scriptures, it's, you might as well just paint a big bullseye target on their chest and another one on their back to make it easier. There's a, a coffee mug I have at home. It's one of my favorite coffee mugs. And again, as a child of the 70s, my favorite cartoon was The Far Side. Do you remember Gary Larson in The Far Side? And there are these two deer out in the woods and they're standing up on their hind legs like Far Side characters would do. And they're sipping coffee and <laughs> as deer do. And one of them has a target on his chest and the other one says bummer of a birthmark Hal I think that's funny but it's not funny if you're the teacher because yeah you get a target you get a target on your on your chest and and Satan is trying to take you out he's trying to take you down how's he gonna do that he's gonna attack anywhere that he can find an opportunity He'll attack reputation. He'll attack your family, those people that you love, so that you're distracted. It, it goes on and on and on. But do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. And those who are sinning, verse 20, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Okay, this is reserved to elders. This is not the first resort of just every person in the church if, if they are sinning. There's a whole process in, the, in Matthew for dealing with sin in the lives of the people in the church. And just to give you the bottom line of that, most of it is, takes place in secret. It's private meetings of encouragement and correction. Hey, could I talk to you privately? There's this thing that I'm concerned about, and could we talk about that? It's not so with pastors. If they... If they're sinning publicly, then the damage is public and the, res and the result or the solution needs to be, a, sorry to say, it needs to be a public solution. Paul is going to bring that public admonishment to, and I'm sorry, not Paul, John is going to bring that public admonishment to Diotrephes when we get into 3 John, especially in verse 10. Paul goes on here in 1 Timothy, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things, what things? The things that I just told you about how to deal with a, a pastor to encourage them and to support them and how to deal with a pastor to, to rebuke them and, and to preserve the integrity of the preaching and teaching ministry. I, I charge you before God. This is a solemn charge and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. So God the Father, God the Son, and all the angels. This is a big deal, that you observe these things without prejudice. What does that mean? It means don't say, yeah, but I really like that pastor. Let's just downplay this. Let's sweep this one under the rug. I mean, everybody deserves a second chance, right? You don't, we don't get to rationalize those who behave corruptly who would be in church leadership. We don't get to say, yeah, but I, but I like him. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. In other words, um, don't give the blessing of leadership to any person in the church without first vetting them or knowing that they have been vetted by others. Don't lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins because if you lay hands on them hastily, and they turn out to be a, teacher, a corrupt teacher, 
You share in their sin. That's what, that's what the implication is here. No, you didn't do the sin yourself. But it kind of rubs off on you that, that, the, that the name is, is dishonored. And so you, you get to share in that sin in that sense. And, you, and he's, then he closes that with keep yourself pure. So this is, this is how we keep ourselves clean in this conduct. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard to do the discipline of God and not get dirty. Because we human beings are pros at making a mess of our lives, aren't we? So sometimes there's not a perfect solution. I think that's what he's saying here. Don't be hasty. Be really reserved and careful about who teaches and thereby keep yourself pure and don't participate in their sin. So now we go to 3 John. We're in 3 John. I say chapter 1 because there's, there's only one chapter. Uh, but we read the elder to the beloved Gaius. This is a letter from one man to one other man. Gaius. Gaius, Gaius, or Caius, however you would like to pronounce it. It's proper any of these ways. Whom I love in truth. And this name, this word beloved, I think that appears like five times in this epistle, beloved. And it's, it's exceedingly rare in the New Testament because it occurs in the vocative case. That's just a fancy way of saying it's a special form of address. As you would see in the Old Testament, like, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That O oh, without the H on the end, that O, shows you vocative, voicing, vocal, vocative. Which, which mean, and, and beloved is not actually a noun, it's an adjective. You are beloved. But he's calling Gaius beloved. He's calling him an adjective, which then serves as a noun. It's kind of like when you, when, if you would call your beloved darling. Darling's actually an adjective. Or or sweetie. That's actually an adjective, not a noun. This is a very intimate, very loving form of address from one man to another. Beloved. I, it has this implication of, I respect you so much. I love you so much. You're a part of this group that I identify with. You're with me, beloved. Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. We talked about this prayer of, of, he says, that you may prosper, that you may be on a good path, is what that literally means. In all things, not, not just in health and as, just as your soul prospers, but in all things. And we talked about what is it proper to pray for another person. And yes, we should pray for their soul, for the well-being of their soul, and we always pray for, for health, that we may be uh, effective in ministry and not... And not hindered in our ministry because of our health, but it is also proper and good to pray that their relationships would be, would be healthy and would be good, and that they would have a job so they, they can support their family, and that they would prosper in what it is that they put their hand to, and that they would be good, good fathers and good mothers, good sons and daughters, effective teachers and ministers, and that they in addition to the fact, you know, Lord, heal their diseases. And so we pray, not just me, not just the pastor, but everybody prays. We should pray for each other for our total well-being. I go to verse, verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified to the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. You, Gaius, I have testimony from people who've seen you, who've watched you, and they tell me that you're walking in the truth. And I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. You, Gaius, are one of my children. I have no greater joy than to hear that you are walking in the truth. These people bring a good report to me. And in the truth, beloved, again, beloved, there's that intimate form of address. You do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren, and you do it for strangers too. The strangers here are ministers who are making the rounds and coming in and teaching. He's being hospitable to them. He's, he's showing them the mercies, the tender mercies of God. Verse 6, 
uh, to strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Well, Not only will he do well, but he will share in their blessing. Verse 7, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. And here's where we pick up with our message today. They went forth for his name's sake. This your scripture may, may, depending on the translation, be slightly different than that. Because the word his and sake, it doesn't appear in the Greek. It's not there. So we talked before about the difference between translation and interpretation. Translation is when you translate the words. Interpretation is when you, when you give the meaning. Like, what does it mean? Well, the words are, <clears throat> on, on behalf of the name, they went forth. The name. Not his name's sake, but the name. That's, that's a fascinating concept. It has not been used heretofore in the New Testament that I'm aware of. On behalf of the name. What is that name? Obviously, it's the name of Jesus Christ. But now the name is personified. It takes on the characteristics of a personality, of a person, the name. Now we are working for the name. It's bigger even than the ministry of Jesus on earth. The name continues after his death, resurrection, and ascension. The name goes on. What is that thing that you are receive at birth and stays with you throughout eternity in heaven? Your name. You get your soul at conception. You get your name at birth. And it stays with you. The name lives on. What is the name? It's the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We take on that name too. Christian. Little Christ. That's what we are. We're a part of the name... We're a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Jesus isn't here anymore. But he sent a comforter. And we carry the name. If you have children, this is one aspect of your immortality. Let me get ancient Jewish on you here a little bit. Part of their idea of the afterlife was that you live on in your children after you die. I think it's true. Because they are literally a, a piece of you and a piece of your spouse joined together and then from that arises a whole new person with a new soul. You get to part, when you reproduce, you get to participate with God in the creation of a person. It takes three to make a human being. A mother, a father, and God. On behalf of the name, these strangers went forth, and they took nothing from the Gentiles. They took, this word Gentiles here, means they took nothing from the unbelievers. They didn't beg for their sustenance from people who are not, don't carry that obligation of family. You know that in our society, the The obligation that each one of us has, the primary obligation, of course, is to God. But then we are are born into an obligation that we did not choose, an obligation to our blood kin. You may not like your little brother, but he's blood. He's your blood. You may not like your uh, in-laws, but through your spouse, their blood. And we have an obligation to help to care for them. The Gentiles, the unbelievers, are under no obligation to care for the ministers of the gospel. That's not their obligation. And we ought not to put that upon them. And that's what he's saying here, saying that you, Gaius, support the strangers. You've shown them hospitality. You've sent them on their way with their sustenance. I don't know if he put coins in their purse or what it was. But 
you sent them on their way for his namesake and took nothing from the Gentiles to accomplish it. And what is this name? There, there's power in this name. We read in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Most assuredly, I, that is Jesus, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name. I will do it. And then Jesus sends out 70 disciples. He sends them out two by two. He sends them out without a staff, without a purse, without extra sandals. And says, like, just rely on the hospitality wherever you go and go minister, and then let's all meet back here and let's talk about it. And they did. And they went out two by two. And they, these 70 disciples came back from their 35 pairings of going out and ministering. And they marvel. And in Mark chapter 16, the 70... Re- The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. There's that name theme again here. Your name is written in heaven. That's where we get the idea that your name goes on forever. God's not going to erase your name just because you died. In fact, he's going to look it up. Whoa, I see this guy is here in my book. Enter into your reward, good and faithful servant. Maybe the most beautiful demonstration of the power of the name of Christ comes to us in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. I'm sorry, beginning in in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, that ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John, go about to go into the temple, ask for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Hallelujah. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and then they knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And of course, everyone rejoiced from there, right? No, that would be too simple. Some people got angry at that. And they challenged Peter and John. Peter and John go on to say, in his name, through faith, in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He was made well by his name, in his name, through his name. The Jewish authorities go on, and this is a big scandal, and it's a big hoopla going on. And in in chapter 4, it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, the elders and the scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, that's not our John, that's a different John there, were gathered together at Jerusalem, and when they had set them in the midst, they 
Set them who? The apostles. They asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? See, they recognize the power in the name. What name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all. Like you asked the question, are you ready for the answer? I'm going to give you the answer. Are you listening now? Wait for it. Wait for it. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you here whole. This is the stone that the builders rejected. Which has become the chief cornerstone. And then not content with that admonishment, they go on not just who got healed here. But he goes on to say, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The most offensive statement in all of Scripture. There's one name which will save you. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the only name. This is the thing that is most offensive about our faith is that it is exclusive. God excludes those who will not bow the knee to Jesus Christ and call upon the name. Verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such. Such who? Those strangers that you sent out with your blessing and support, we also ought to receive them that we may become fellow workers for the truth. We talked a little bit about this last week. When you support the workers for the truth, no matter who they are, you participate in their ministry. It is credited to you in heaven as, yes, you you partnered in that ministry. You know, the way that Paul and Silas would partner. We, that John and Peter would partner. Whatever Peter did, John is recorded in heaven as getting the reward. Whatever John did, Peter is recorded in heaven as getting the reward. Paul and Apollos, Paul and Silas. In fact, this word fellow workers here is sooner goi, sooner goi. We get the word synergy from that. Isn't that cool? Soon, meaning together. Uh, Ergoi, ergos, we get ergonomics from that, working. Sooner goi, it's this idea of working together. The idea that two people working together can do more than two people's work. Sometimes you just need a third hand to accomplish a task. And by bringing that third hand along, you do the work of more people. I do some construction. And I can tell you that I can climb up a ladder all by myself with a two by eight plank that's eight feet long, and I can walk on rafters and I can carry it around up on the roof and looking like a you know a balancing act up there. And I can nail it in. But give me a sixteen foot long plank, and I need help. Because if I go up on that roof balancing along on a two by rafter up there. With a 16-footer in my arms, I may just fall over and become injured. But two of us, we can knock that out fast. Hey, you grab this end, I grab that end. And we get more than the work of two individual people working alone done. We actually get the work of three people done. Three people working alone, we can do it two people together. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. When you partner with those in ministry, you become the third hand that makes that work happen. So I told the story a couple years ago about a lady who uh, lived, I forget what country it was, I think it, I want to say Bulgaria, but I could be wrong. This is back under communism. And 
she was translating the sermons from cassette tape, listening to it. She was translating the sermons of a Christian preacher into their language where there were not good Bible teachings. And she was giving, handing that off to a publishing house and they were publishing in print the sermons that she heard on the cassette. She was bedridden and could only use one finger. And she plunked, plinked it all out on a typewriter with one finger, like that. Sermon after sermon. Anybody who participated with her and supported her in that shared in her reward. She shared in the reward of the preacher. Nobody ever, we don't know her name. Verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. We don't know who this Diotrephes is. It's a Greek name. Um, and the actual Greek here says, I wrote something to the church. I wrote something to the church. So I wrote directly to the church as a whole. But Diotrephes intercepted the letter. And he quashed the letter. Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. He won't receive our letters. He won't receive our workers. He won't receive our visitors. So I, so I John, here's the implication. I, John, I'm writing to you, Gaius, now, because I can't write to the church as a whole. If I send it to the church secretary, it goes straight to Diotrephes, and he buries it. So I'm sending this to you, my friend, who live in the same town, And I know that you won't bury this letter. He loves, uh, Diotrephes loves to have the preeminence among them. In other words, he loves to be first among them. He does not welcome us. He doesn't receive us. He loves to be first. How does he do that? Where, where did he get this power to put himself in over the church and that he can, we'll read uh, in the next verse, he can put people out of the church. How, how does that happen? He's just one guy. Well, how does it happen in any church? Just one guy. What, where, where, does, where does this power come from? It's not from the Holy Spirit. It comes because we give that power. Because we're gullible sometimes. And we get drawn in to a false teacher. Why? Because they're confident they're assertive. They have a bearing and a charisma and a manner that just inspires confidence. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about, and I, can, and I can tell it to you with absolute certainty. And then you can go home and say, wow, I just feel so inspired because, because that teacher, that preacher, really knows what he's talking about. No, he doesn't. He just acts like it. And we can get drawn into that, and then we, we un unwittingly, we yield power to them over our lives. Whereas what we should be doing is we should be godly skeptical of those in leadership. Don't give them too much leash. Don't give preachers like me so much weight with our words that you, that you put it right up there with the Word of God and with the revelation from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'm just a commentator. I'm just a teacher. This is not a high and lofty role. I get to study and teach things. Other Bible teachers get to study and teach things. But you need to go home and compare it to the Scriptures and see whether it's true. And if it's not, you need to call it out. Call it out. Diotrephes got this power because the people gave him the power. And he probably had a a group of cronies, a group of people who also stood with him in this and supported him blindly in whatever he did. And this is a recipe for a cult. This is how cults happen. Blind allegiance, blind obedience to a teacher. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something from my own life. Not that I did, but that, that happened uh, I haven't been a pastor that long. I've been a pastor for nine years. Before this, I was you know, businessman and construction manager and in law enforcement and some other things. 
And so we moved to this state about 10 years ago, and we joined this church, Calvary Chapel of Leesburg, and we were in the pews and worshiping and everything. There was a pastor and all. And that then that pastor decided he wanted to sell his business and move on uh, to another city. A good godly man. I love that man still to this day. And I hold him in very, very high regard. But this, the story is not about him. The story is about this. My first Sunday in the pulpit as the pastor of this church, nine years ago, I had the sad duty to explain to the congregation what had happened the previous Friday. That a pastor in our movement over a church with about 24,000 members had been found out in living a double life. and was brought under church discipline. And his pulpit was taken away from him then. And several people in the church, this church, had lived and benefited and prospered under that teacher's ministry for years. And I go back and I've gone back and listened to some of his messages and they were spot on. Good teaching. I, I, I can't. I got no explanation for how this happens, but it happens. And the church reacted the right way, I think. They took down the teachings off the internet. And they said, "We're not going to talk to the press about this." And it's this is a discussion within the Church of God. We're dealing with it, and they dealt with it. They removed him from influence. They removed him from leadership. And they tried to help him privately with counseling and support, things like that. That was good. They did those things right. But it's a shame that it got to such a stage. And I heard another pastor sometime later kind of explain it this way. I paraphrase. He said, when people revere a pastor like a rock star, and you treat him like a rock star, and you pay him like a rock star, pretty soon he starts thinking he's a rock star. And then he acts like a rock star. And he, don't be surprised then when he falls like a rock star. So maybe some people there kind of shared in his downfall by giving him too much adulation, by giving him too much unskeptical affirmation. Always run the teachings that you hear by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in prayer all the time. We raised nine children in our family. And we, we took this teaching that I'm bringing to you to heart in that we never, ever regarded the church as the primary means of transmitting the Bible to our children. That job belongs to the parents. The church is to support that. It's to help with that. But the responsibility is on the parents. Verse 10. Therefore, if I, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, that is, Diotrephes' deeds, which he does, prating against us. What an old-fashioned word, prating. Prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Now we just got done with the second epistle of John, and lo and behold, in the same verse, verse 10, we're told in second John, if somebody brings to you a different gospel, don't receive him. Don't even show him hospitality. Send him on his way lest you participate in his sin. Now here, Diotrephes is turning that around on John, the apostles, the, and, and, and these, these godly teachers, and he's not receiving the teaching of the man who is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Probably the last living apostle at this point. An apostle whose reputation is crystal. It's clean. It's, he has a good reputation. 
Diotrephes thinks he's of such standing that he can put the apostle John out and those that John sends. John hopes to come. He's like, I have to deal with this in person. There's some things you just can't do in a letter. So if I come, he's, he's hoping here, but then he's going to go on to explain that he's, he's pretty sure he's coming. If I come, I will call to mind his deeds, with, uh, which he does. And what does that mean, I will call to mind? It's like, I will remember them, and I'll sit there and ponder them over coffee? No. John is saying, I will stand up in the congregation and call this behavior out in public to the congregation. Remember what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 5? That's how you deal with an unrepentant Bible teacher who, who won't listen to reason, who won't back down, and who behaves abominably. You call them out publicly. You have to for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the name, the name. He prates against us. In other words, he, he talks nonsense. He he runs on with meaningless words, is the Greek. Against us with malicious words. And he's not even content with that. He's not content just to like let you, you know, let the teachers from John, that John sends, to just sit there and like, like quiet, be quiet, I'm talking, I'm teaching. No, he says like, and you, need, you guys need to get up and walk out the door. And ushers, would you put them out? He's not content just to deal with John's emissaries with words. He puts them out of the church. If I come, I'm going to call to mind his deeds, which, which he does, talking nonsense against us with malicious words. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end there for today. I'm out of time. We'll finish up next week. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to compare and contrast all of these epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. They're not, they're, not like, they're not completely separate in their doctrine, in their teaching. It's a continuous flow of teaching here. They all complement each other, and we're going to tie it all up together. And then we're going to emphasize what is this thing of us and them. And no, I'm not going to play Pink Floyd on the, on the screen up here, but you can go home and listen to it. Um, we'll tie that up, and then the following week we'll go into the epistle of Jude. And there's some big surprises in Jude. Things that you would go, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Would you rise with me, and we'll sing the doxology to close us out. Lord God, I pray that you be with us as we go on our way this week and that you would bring meaning and understanding to this teaching. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great week. Ladies Bible study after church, and I'm going to be holding forth at Firehouse Subs over salads and sandwiches if you want to join me.